Thanks for uh, being warm toward each other. It means a lot to be able to uh, just step back and watch all those, uh, those connections take place. It is so good to be home. We missed you all last Sunday morning a lot. Uh, I have to be honest with you. I've uh, been in uh, this vocation for a while, and uh, the truth is most weddings are really not very interesting. <laughs> now, I can only speak from the XY chromosome perspective, but for me, from my starting point, most weddings snoozer. I'm just, I, I just, there's just not much that you haven't seen before, you know what I mean by that? And the details, they, they really don't interest me at all. But this wedding, the Janet reference that we were just at last weekend, really was super fun. It was amazing. We were out in this park, and all these folding chairs were set up in the mud by this pond. And the, the bride came down a path through the trees, with, and the groom did the same, and they, they sat down, and we were right behind Grandma. She was in the front row, just the way it should be, you know? And uh, the uh, minister was my brother-in-law, Don, who did a wonderful job uh, with the service. It was very warm, and the whole thing turned into a family reunion. Everybody from Janet's family, with the exception of one niece who lives very far away, was there. The entire shooting match. So if you've wondered what Janet looks like in context, well, there it is. <laughs> this is uh, Mom uh, there in the front, and Janet in the back. You can see her brother Marlon and her sister. She comes from a family of six kids. So when you get them all together, that explains the loud part. That, that we referenced, and we totally had a blast. There was a rock band that insisted on playing nothing but hard rock songs and having a big attitude about it. Like the lead singer slouches over the microphone at one point and says, are we playing too many cliche wedding ballads for you? <laughs> Which no one thought was funny at all. <laughs> and so everybody's dancing and having, uh, having an absolutely great time, and then uh, the sun begins to go down, it's time to go home, and I, I am sent to find the car. Five minutes later, I am lost in the woods. Now, if you know me, you know I do not believe in the outdoors. I know it's there, but I believe that the outdoors is our great enemy and needs to be resisted in every way we possess. And so it's now dark, and I am crashing through the trees, walking downhill on muddy paths with my dress clothes on, a sports coat. I'm not sort of all L.L. Bean here, you know, with combat boots and all that. I've got this kind of junk on, and, and, and I'm crashing all down through the mud and the dirt, looking around. It's getting darker and darker and darker. Uh, I'm from the suburbs of Pittsburgh, so I'm thinking about snakes and grizzly bears and all of the mountain lions and things that want to eat me. Uh, as soon as the sun goes down, and so I reach this open area, which looks familiar, and there's my brother-in-law standing out in the middle of the grass, and I go up to him, Marlon, where am I? He says, oh, there's three parking lots. Did you know that? No, that would have been helpful. None of them are marked or numbered in, in any way. He points me in the right direction, and it turns out my car is at 50 feet away. It's just on the other side of the trees. I find it, and, and, and we're rescued. And this is a small parable of how weddings work. It all seems like such a good idea, and then there's the marriage. <laughs> Friday night, we watched The Dark Knight here, and the Joker at one point turns to Batman and says, do I look like a guy with a plan? Here's what I am. I'm a dog chasing cars, and I wouldn't know what to do with one if I caught it. Well, 360 Church has caught the car. We have crossed the line. We're in a new relationship with Jesus because we have started a church. And now we have to do something with it. You know, sometimes people look at our website and from all the blogging and the things going on, they, we've actually had this conversation. They draw the conclusion that we're a mega church. And then they come here on Sunday morning and they say, what? Where are the other 3,000 people? And we have to tell them they're all in there. They just haven't come out yet. See, now that we've got this great website with all this stuff on it, we have to become the church that the website describes. <laughs> so this is the wonderful blessing of the internet. Is now we're committed to being 
what we say we are because we're on the record to the universe as representing certain kinds of things. So it, it all seems easy right up until you have to sort of start living it out. The same with the getting married, saying it's like a wonderful idea and it's all about flowers and dresses and ceremonies until you get to the point where you actually wake up the next day and you have to have the whole real life part that all comes with it and you have to work all of that out and it gets terribly complicated. The New Testament book of Acts is the story of another group of people who decided to start a church. They did it 2,000 years ago in the city of Jerusalem under Roman occupation because they were followers of Jesus who felt that they were called as a group to bring the good news about his death and resurrection to what probably in their minds was the whole known world, the whole Roman Empire at the time, and ultimately the rest of the world as well. This story tells the tale of what it takes to go from the good idea to the actual living out of being a group like us. You know, there's nothing in the Bible that says that you have to talk to anybody when you have coffee in the middle of a service break. It just sort of happens. So there's some stuff that happens spontaneously like that, and that's wonderful, but how do you actually make the whole thing work? How do we become the thing that the beginning predicted that we would? Now, this is not a matter of trying to get people to sign off on a set of beliefs or to adopt a certain political position or anything like that. If that were the case, we could simply email you a couple of documents, one with what you had to believe, another with the politics you had to have, and then you'd be good to go. But, you know, those things kind of come and go. They're not really the point of it. The other day I had to get on an airplane, and I was so relieved this time that no one was going to frisk me. <laughs> so relieved, because my relationship with the TSA is, it's complicated. <laughs> So I walk up, and I'm, I've got this, so what's going to happen to me this time, kind of an attitude. And uh, no one attempts to put their hands on me, for which I am greatly relieved, but they do send me into this very large machine. Have you done this one yeah, at the yeah. Oakland Airport or SFO? Yeah. Or, and and they, they actually say something, it's just like on TV, like assume the position. And the new position that says I surrender to the power of the federal government looks yeah. like this. <laughs> Now, it's not the position itself that troubles me. It's the fact that someone is taking a picture of me straight through my clothing. And I do not appreciate that. And as I'm standing there like this, with this photograph, this humiliating thing happening to me, I tend to go all Fox News. Get the government out of my life. And as soon as I step out of the booth, it passes. And I'm back to the regular NPR me. There's nothing wrong with a little government. <laughs> so if we go that route with trying to determine who and what we're supposed to be, the truth is we're just going to end up in a mess and we're going to miss the whole point. How do we be married? Since the New Testament describes the church as the bride of Christ, it's kind of appropriate to think of it because starting one of these, a new congregation, puts a different dimension in our relationship with Jesus than we had before we were an us. Yep. Now that we're an us, it's a different deal. I mean, what you know, how do you know what it's all supposed to look like? This book of Acts that is the story of the first group of people that decided to do this. So we're in a very long-standing historical tradition here, which makes me feel great about what we're doing. Tells us that after his death for the sins of the world and his resurrection. Uh, Jesus, before he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, spent time, 40 days, with his followers in the city of Jerusalem. And in the first chapter of Acts, in verse 3, it gives us a snapshot of what those 40 days were like. We know almost nothing about it, just fragments, but here's the core of it. In verse 3, was written by a man named Luke, who was inspired by God, to give us these words. He says, he, meaning Jesus, presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs. In other words, he spent a lot of time allowing people to get close enough to him to see that he actually really was alive again. And that was the foundation of everything. And with that accomplished, Luke goes on to say this, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about organizational theory. <laughs> and speaking about self-help advice. 
and speaking about eHarmony.com and speaking about the importance of Google and the internet. For 40 days he talked about nothing but the kingdom of God and I don't think he exhausted the subject. With only one small window before he ascended to heaven, he chooses the kingdom of God as the thing to talk about. You know what that tells me? It tells me that the way to do a church isn't to do a church at all. The way to do a church is to live the kingdom of God in the world. To live out the rule of God in the world. If we do that, the church stuff is going to be just fine. If we don't do that, what difference will the rest of this make? We can have, you know, I was raised on potluck suppers. I'm mad now, so I should probably not talk about this, but when I think of it, how many potluck dinners were inflicted upon me in my church background? They were ground up uh, pork. We called it ham loaf. They made the whole pig walk into the grinder. And on the other side came out this meatloaf thing that was made all out of pork. It was absolutely horrible. And to make it palatable to us, they drowned it in cherry sauce, which was really just cherry pie filling, the generic kind with the yellow labels. They would pour that on, dump salt and pepper all over it, and we would eat this. And along with that, we would have uh, lime green jello with mandarin oranges dumped into it. Have you had that? Or, or carrot slivers? You would put these together, and in the cultural background that I had uh, in, in religion, uh, this was a fellowship meal. We were supposed to rejoice over eating this. We were supposed to be glad to be together while our arteries were being stuffed with saturated fat grams and our blood glucose level was in the 600 range. Oh, thank you, God. It's so wonderful to follow Jesus. This, this church thing is it's so 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 life-giving. I mean, if, if we're not living the reign of God, then that's all we've got is potluck dinners. I don't know about you, but I want more than jello out of this deal. Can I get an amen from the house? Or you could say go bears if you prefer that. <laughs> but what does it mean to live out the reign of God? How can you tell if a group of people actually were attempting to do that? And certainly, even on our best day, it will only be an approximation. But how could you tell if we were giving it our best shot? You see... If we have the kingdom of God, living the reign of God as the foundation, everything else changes. When we were at this wonderful wedding, it was wonderful for a lot of reasons. We just, we love these two young people that got married. We just, we've had a relationship with them for years and we, and we, we simply really just like them so much. The other wonderful thing was she proposed to him. Awesome. Oh, somebody say awesome. Awesome. Thank you. And when uh, they came down the aisle and, and my brother-in-law uh, did the vows and everything, it was, it was so touching. And when he, you know, you turn the couple around and you present them to their friends and you say, I now present, and you say their name, and everybody just erupted. I mean, some people stood up, there was clapping and hooting, and if we had had air horns, they would have gone off. I mean, it was, you think it was loud at the reception. It was so great. It was such a spontaneous, unscheduled time of explosive celebration and I was part of it and later I thought you know when you just move in together you don't get that yep that's right nobody gets a microwave no one registers at target I wonder if there's a if there's some meaning there there's kind of a message there because what these two kids did with her proposing to him as uh, they both pushed all their chips out into the middle of the table. It was a total commitment. And that brings total rejoicing. If we don't live the reign of God, we have held a bunch of our chips back. If we do, one day in his presence, there'll be total rejoicing, and we're going to have a blast along the way as well. The kingdom perspective changes everything about what we do. We're not here uh, so that one day we can end up on a magazine cover. We're here to live the reign of God in a way that helps other people think, you know, maybe I could step into the circle of God's concern and I could live that way as well. Now, the first chapter of Acts just gives us some quick examples of how that might play itself out in specifics in terms of how this early group of Christians lived. We're not going to spend a lot of time on each. They're just quick snapshots of what this might look like in behavioral terms because 
I don't know about you, but I find that if I don't see an example of it, it's harder for me to sort of grasp what's going on. And so Luke's inspired by God to give us some specific examples. The first one is in verse 4 when he writes this. And while staying with them, this is Jesus, orders them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, I'm pretty convinced they have no idea what he's talking about here. Uh, this, this is not some kind of revival meeting or something. These are just a bunch of guys from Galilee and their families. They don't know what's going on. Baptized in the Holy Spirit? Righto. <laughs> Whatever that is, we sign a card? Uh, do you get a key ring or a bracelet? You know, what, what happens? And yet what he's trying to tell them is that I'm going to send you the kind of power that will allow you to attempt what cannot be done. When we live the rule of God, we're going to try things that aren't possible. We tell people all the time when we're on the road, we haven't not come to Berkeley because we know what will happen. We came to Berkeley because here there's no telling what will happen. <laughs> we love that aspect of the city, that the potential of what you guys are capable of is beyond my ability to calculate. I don't know what you could all do, and I'm thrilled about that. The idea that we could organize you or shuffle you all into a bunch of little pigeonholes makes me sick. What I love is the idea that what the Spirit of God has put in you, God can release yeah. through our relationship and love for one another, yeah. and you can have a life that is so far above my ceiling of expectation that we'll look back one day when we're retired and greeters at Walmart and say, oh, we, we knew him. <laughs> we, knew, we knew her. You know, my uh, college debate partner, posted the very first digital song that ever appeared online. If I'm remembering correctly, it was an ACDC number. And he has worked uh, in a major position in the recording industry. And uh, I Facebook every now and then, how you doing, Jim? And you know, we're not really in touch, but I, I see him from afar and I think, I knew him. I knew him. And one day I'll be able to say, I knew Daniel. Oh, I remember Randy. Yeah, he started out with sushi and changed the world. <laughs> I knew Dallas, I knew Jasmine, I, I, I knew all these people. That, that, that's just un, unbelievable because they attempted the impossible because they relied on the Spirit of God and God's power rather than on their own abilities, which were prodigious. And that will be the central challenge we'll have to undertake because you guys are capable of doing so much it will be very difficult not to rely on that. Now, we'll see all of it blossom and be in service to God, but the real paradox of it is being able to fully deploy everything that the Spirit has put in you and at the same time never trust it, but to trust in the power of the Spirit of God to go way beyond what you're capable of. You know, when you get married, that's kind of what changes too. I was thinking about this today, how much when people are together... In a marriage relationship, they have to rely on each other. Now, at, we have, uh, my wife's relationship with technology is complicated. <laughs> and when something goes wrong on the ancient, underpowered PC that we have resurrected over and over and over that Jan uses, uh, she could fix like 95% of it. She's, Janet is, in my estimation, superwoman. And at the last 5%, I am the IT department. And so 2 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, I'm trying to figure out why Google is so very angry at her. And Gmail is not talking to her, and there's conflict on all hands, and uh, the server's not available, and my own personal favorite, the unresponsive script warning, which is running and running and running, which is a new definition of eternity, if you've ever had one. And I have to jump in, and uh, so Jan has to be able to know that I'll get that done for her, that she can rely on me, just the way she knows that if the grass gets too tall, I will cut it. Eventually. <laughs> and so she can call me in and, and, and I'll try to fix that thing. And, and there was the, having somebody else there lets you try stuff you wouldn't try otherwise. Yeah, that's good. And knowing that you're leaning on the power of God, you know what? You'll take chances that you wouldn't take otherwise if you feel like you're alone. 
And it's those chances that are going to take you guys to places and doing things that there aren't. Some of you are going to do stuff there aren't names for yet. You're going to write the textbooks that other people are going to read that follow after you because you didn't lean on what the Bible in this beautiful illustration calls the arm of flesh, but you leaned on the power of God and you were able to try stuff that wasn't even in your mind a month ago. Then in verse 6, Luke goes on to record this. Uh, So when they came together, they asked him, they were curious about this Holy Spirit thing, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? In other words, they're saying, God, are you going to give us power so we can have a kind of uprising to throw the Romans out? And he responded this way. He said to them, it's not for you to know times or season that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. And I think here's the phrase that captures my heart this morning. And to the end of the earth, if we're living the reign of God, we're attempting things that can't be done, we're also growing beyond what is familiar. Uh, I think before these words are spoken, this group is, you know, they're just like us. <laughs> this group is probably totally convinced that the whole Jesus thing is essentially confined to the suburbs of Jerusalem. And he says, well, if you think it's uncomfortable to move from Galilee to Jerusalem, the truth is you're going to go to places that you can't pronounce, where they don't even speak languages that you understand, and what you're going to bring is not uh, an uprising. You're going to bring something way more important than that. Uh, You're going to bring the good news that I have died for sin and death to be taken out of the world if people will receive me by faith, and I've come back to life, and through that you can step into the kingdom reign of God, and put your, if you will, picture in a much larger frame than it has ever been in before. You have not just a better life, but a life that's so different from what's possible without it that it's even hard to put into words sometime, and that's what makes it good news. I want you to step out of the circle of your own concern and step into the circle of God's concern and go to the places where people need to hear this good news outside uh, of the familiar because you've got that kind of, uh, of connection with me and that, that desire uh, in your heart. When you step over the line into marriage, the same kind of thing happens. You can step out of the familiar because you have somebody there with you, uh, a companion, a friend, uh, support. And in truth, when you have that kind of relationship, you can grow in some significant ways. Uh, There are wonderful ways to grow when you're not married, too. So I'm not comparing the two. I'm just saying, per se, when you're in that relationship, uh, it it can be an amazing thing. So when I'm working on my PhD at Northwestern, Janet worked to put me through school. When she did her doctoral studies and her MDiv, my wife has done more graduate school than virtually anyone in the Northern Hemisphere When she completed her doctorate, I worked and put her through school, and both of those things took us out of the familiar. I would hate to see our gratitude for touching 30 people inoculate us against the desire to touch 300. You might say, well, where are the other 270? When I look at these rooms around us, I don't see Sunday school classrooms. We'll use them for training and teaching and all that for sure. But when I look at these rooms and this space, you know the hardest thing to come by in our city is space and parking? Those are like, you you need an act of God and an act of Congress (laughs) to get space and parking together. We have that. Who has that with all the issues that we have? I see these rooms being used by community groups and businesses starting up and attorneys and Uh, neighborhood associations and recovery groups and all kinds of things right here in the heart of downtown we can serve our campus and serve our community and just these amazing ways because we have what Berkeley does not have those are the two huge voids here space and parking to be able to make those available uh, we can illustrate by how we live and by our generosity what it means to live the reign of God because I'll tell you this For Californians, if you can live it in real estate, it is the truth. 
There's nothing we're into more than we are real estate in, in this particular part of the country. And if we make those kinds of things available, we don't have all the specifics of it worked out, but we see that in our future. We're already getting people with inquiries about what this will mean. Now that will take us beyond the familiar because you're supposed to have one of these on a Sunday, have some classes preceding it, and then lock the building up tight for six days against the danger that someone might think of a way to use it. That's what the six in our name stands for. The other six days of the week. We are going to grow into what is not familiar. I see us much larger. I see us with multiple locations. I see us in a permanent facility someplace. Who knows? Maybe this place. We don't know that. But we are going to go to places we have not been. So if you think it's been weird to this point, just wait. <laughs> just wait. Then in verse 14... All of the people who are following Jesus in the city are gathered together, and Luke records this. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. While they're waiting to find out what's going to happen next, they devote themselves to prayer, which tells me that to live out the reign of God, uh, if, I'm, if I'm trying what can't be done, if I'm growing out of what is beyond the familiar for me, that I'm also prioritizing intimacy, that being close with each other and with God in this particular example in prayer is the most significant and important thing that we can do. In the same way, using my marriage uh, analogy, that couples that aren't emotionally and physically intimate, it really doesn't matter if the checkbook is balanced. Now I'll tell you this too, if the checkbook's not balanced, you can forget about the intimacy part. <laughs> If your budget's not working, it's really bad for your relationship. But if those two things aren't there, it just, so you have a piece of paper. Well, great for you. Last night, I, uh, I did the unthinkable. It was late. I guess my defenses were down. I was tired. Long week. And so I... Uh, not proud of this, but I watched opera. <laughs> opera. <laughs> On TiVo. <laughs> With, uh, wow, people singing in unknown tongues. <laughs> Very large Italian people singing at great length, two and a half hours. Opera. Now there is only one force on this planet that would move me to listen to people singing in a language I can't understand for an hour, portraying a story that I don't get <laughs> in a way that I absolutely do not enjoy even one little particle. And that reason is because my wife loves opera. <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about here when I say prioritizing intimacy. Because if I don't listen to people singing Italian, there are two problems. One is, how do I pay Janet back for hundreds of hours watching the Pittsburgh Steelers? I, I have no way. I have no currency. You see where I'm going with that? <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, uh, she likes it. So I can pull the man thing and say, well, I have you know, a lot of important things to do. There's, I have a science fiction novel to read and <laughs> you know, Law and Order's on. <laughs> so don't bother me with that stuff but the truth of the matter is that on my best days and an awful lot of them are not good days as a husband but on my best days uh, what she likes uh, it, it matters it matters and I'm so glad my wife is so good to me every time the Steelers are on she just she'll turn on the TV and just turn it on for me I grew up in Pittsburgh I've been a Steeler fan for 50 years I know, isn't that breathtaking? 
so I've been watching them since just after the Civil War. So Jenna turns that on, and you know, uh, that's my 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 love language is the safety blitz. You know, I see that it all happen, and I just love it. So I just I felt this was so weird because I just can't I I just uh, can't abide opera. And yet, at the end of it, I felt close to her in some strange way. If we're going to live the reign of God, um, this is intangible. We have to have that close feeling with God, with Jesus. And that comes from individually and collectively spending time in relationship with God directly through prayer. We're going to do some creative prayer stuff in the future. And... We would just love to have you be part of that. Because if, if we ask God to help us, God will help us. And we'll be able to see the kinds of things that aren't possible take place. That's what these guys did at the beginning. And they were walking out this kingdom reality. I think if we do that, we're in pretty solid ground. And then a practical problem came up. Judas had betrayed Jesus. He's dead at this point. There's kind of a hole in the apostolic group. What do we do with that? And their answer is very interesting, and it's in verse 24. And they prayed and said, uh, you, Lord, notice how they pray when they ask God to uh, fill this hole. You, Lord, who knows the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen. They had narrowed it down to two people through a process of nomination to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, that's a really interesting decision-making system, isn't it? Have you ever seen a congregation say, well, here's the annual business meeting. We've got three different scenarios for the budget. Short straw gets it. <laughs> I, I just, it's, it's crazy. So when, when people press me about, well, a church has to run this way or that way, I point them to a passage like this and say, well, let's just do it the New Testament way. You know, let's just roll the dice. It'll, it will all be good. The key here is that their hearts were yielded to God. They prayed and asked the Lord to help, and God did help them in this situation. You don't see all that much lot casting as things go along, but at the beginning, this is meeting number one. Nobody knows what to do. This is all experimental. So they're drawing a little bit on Jewish tradition, a little bit on pop culture, and they're you know, kind of trying to get it all to flow together and, and, and trying to get it to work. And what, what I see them doing is, using organization as a means and not as an end. In other words, the point is not to grow some big thing. The point is not to have some building. The point is not to have 14 committees. Uh, the, the point is not to take over a bunch of struggling churches so we can say, oh, we're a network now, 360 net. You know, the point is to have as little organization as possible and to only organize when it supports our desire to live out the reign of God to keep things as simple as it can be. And marriage kind of works the same way. At our house, we have a very simple organizational plan, and here it is. Janet finds the things that need killing, and I kill them. <laughs> it's a two-step plan. Step one, target acquisition. If it flies, it dies. If it crawls, it's mauled. Step two, target elimination. So she identifies sometimes through hysterical screaming <laughs> things that fly and crawl that really need killing. And then I bring down flaming death from above. <laughs> sometimes I just I look at the thing in the corner and actually we're not sure if it's a bug or sock lint, you know, how, from a distance and really who wants to get close. I'm the one who does the close-up recon. So I get a broom handle and I say, I'm going in. <laughs> track the thing down. Sometimes I have to take it hand to hand. I mean, it's eyeball to eyeball. Who wants it the most? And other times I just get a, you know, like a, one of those gas grenades that raid cells and I just roll it in and close the door, you know, duct tape it up and, and, and make the thing die. And uh, I just go back into uh, standby mode and, and I wait for the next thing that, that needs to be uh, uh, eliminated. And uh, this plan really works very well. Uh, because uh, if my wife feels safe, things are good. So when we go to sleep at night, I'm the one with the baseball bat in the corner, not her. I'm the one with the huge aluminum CSI flashlight on the bedside table, not her. And if something goes bump in the night, that's considered target discovery. 
And my job is to go and blind the intruder with my CSI flashlight just before I hit a double with his head like right out the window. I guess that's the plan. I don't know. We've never had an intruder. I just know that if there's a threat there, my job is to be called in. I'm SEAL Team 6. I'm whatever I am. And I just go in and I make it all go away. And if she feels good about that, then I feel good about that. And what makes it function is it's a very simple system. And we're going to try to keep things that simple so we're not serving the organization, oiling a bunch of gears, but we're actually living out the reign of God. And here's the key, because you might actually have time to do that. <laughs> Yesterday we were at the very first Berkeley Coffee and Tea Festival. Yeah, did anybody go? It was really fun. There were 400 people there, plus tons of vendors uh, who were all selling their coffee and giving out lots of free samples. It was well worth the price of admission. Janet and I were in charge of the door prize giveaway segment of the experience, meaning that uh, we handled all the prizes as the numbers were called and pulled people out of the crowd. And uh, we had staff t-shirts like the security people at a rock concert had. <laughs> And we were uh, in in this big area. It was total. Of course, it was a Berkeley crowd, so nobody listens to you, even when you're on the microphone. It's 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 amazing. Like three people are looking at their numbers, and everybody else is milling around trying to create anarchy. It was so fun. <laughs> <coughs> and there were all kinds of pastries from Denmark, and Pete's was there, and uh, probably 20 of the local coffee roasters, maybe 30, were there. They all contributed the door prizes. It, it, we are having a totally great day. We love being involved with this city. It is the most interesting, fun place ever. And then all of a sudden, I, I go up to the fills counter looking for a sample of, of their coffee. And they're so generous. They not only give me a sample, they give me an entire cup of my favorite fills blend, which is so great. And I tell them, I, we just we love your coffee. We really like your coffee store. We, we do meetings there quite a bit, although you know it's so full, sometimes it's hard to get in because it's so popular. And uh, it's a great location, and uh, we love the floor show, you know, where they pour the coffee through the air. Have you seen that? Back and forth like that. It's, it's worth the trip just to see them do this. They give you a little coffee lecture, like you're smart, not like your dumb lecture. And they get you all oriented to how to make your own, how to make it better at home, et cetera, et cetera. And then I turn around, and who is standing right there but Phil? Phil Jaber is from Ramallah. His family moved here in 1920. And he and his son, or the two names on his business card, uh, are running the business. So he has come for this trade show. And he's just like the coolest guy ever. It's this little Frank Sinatra hat that he wears and some jewelry and uh, these great black glasses. and. He's talking to me, and I'm telling him, Phil, we love your store. We are so glad you're in Berkeley. We, you could not build enough stores here that we couldn't fill up. I mean, really, I think that's how popular Phil's is. And he said, well, we're planning to do several more right here in town. So I'm thinking, what about downstairs here? That would totally work for me. <laughs> and how, how great his coffee is, how popular it is. And you know, stores are classy, and they're really different and unique. And the staff, they pay attention to you. They actually look you in the eye, and they, they talk to you. And they're very interesting, smart people to talk to. And he, he leans over, and he says, well, you know, <laughs> people with class, they recognize each other. <laughs> I thought, I, dude, I, I know this is a trade show, and you've said that a thousand times to a million people. That is so awesome. <laughs> I'm going to say that to everybody right now. So we were like this, you know. And so at this point in his presence, I'm just a fanboy. I mean, I'm just this fawning, ridiculous fanboy because I think this is so great. Uh, to meet this guy, and I'm so thrilled that he's going to uh, to open new stores, and it's it's uh, it's great to meet an older guy who's like a hipster at the same time, and he has this wonderful accent, his roots uh, in Ramallah, and it just it, it was it's totally great, and meeting him permanently changed my relationship with his store because now I've met the owner. 
when you live the reign of God, you give people outside of faith a chance to meet the owner. Because when they meet us, individually or collectively, it should be like me meeting Phil. The whole thing means something different because there's this larger person behind it. Not just a set of beliefs and certainly not some sort of set of politics. Because what we represent isn't just those. We don't represent those at all. We represent a person, Jesus of Nazareth, who's given himself to free us from sin and death and risen from the dead and allow us the great privilege of being involved in starting one of these where our hope, our faith is that other people will be able to meet the owner. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, if you would, please, for just a moment. And our band is going to return to lead us in just a little more singing. During this time, we have a couple of things that we do. One is this could be just a great time to just kind of think about what's been shared today or what you've been feeling today and uh, pray over it or ask the Lord to speak to you about it. But also, if you have any need today for uh, prayer and you'd just like someone to agree with you in prayer and to do that in a in a discreet and understanding way, uh, we'll have several of our leaders back in uh, the lounge area, right back here behind you, and they'll be glad to meet with you and uh, pray with you. What you say to them is just between you and, and them, so you never need to be concerned about that. But if you're in one of those spots where it would just be really good to have somebody agree with you for, for God to help you, uh, we'll be available during this worship time. And then uh, when our band is finished, we'll be back and uh, we'll, we'll have communion together.